the telephone, long before we could send text messages and slide into the DMs of our favorite superstar, people of olden times would use it to talk to one another using only their voice. This device connected the world in a way that was impossible before its invention. No matter how good the ear horn or strings connected by cans, it just didn't work as good as the telephone. This revolutionary device didn't just happen without overcoming difficulties of science and circumstance. It was through a tragedy involving his mother that Alexander Graham Bell found inspiration to connect the world in ways we could never have imagined. It was in 1847 when Alexander Graham Bell was born in Edinburgh, Scotland. He grew up there with his father, Alexander Melville Bell, a phonetician, along with his mother, Eliza, and his two brothers, Melville and Edward. Known by friends and close relatives as Alec, he had a mind for science at a very young age. At 12, he invented a de-husking machine to separate the chaff from the wheat. His best friend, Ben, had a father who owned a flour mill, and in return for the invention, gave the boys a workshop in the mill for them to invent things. Already having a fascination with sound, Bell taught himself to play the piano and would frequently entertain friends and family with voice tricks akin to ventriloquism. While he was still 12, his mother began to lose her hearing. Alec developed unique ways to communicate with her. The pair had a kind of sign language so that he could translate to her what others were saying. He was deeply affected by his mother's hearing loss, and it was because of the disability that he focused his talents on studying acoustics, a trade that would make his mark on the world and forever mark him in the pages of history. Although his academic performance was lackluster, Bell seemed to only care about science, paying little attention to the other subjects. He conducted an experiment with his dog by teaching him to growl continuously. He would then manipulate the dog's lips and vocal cords, making the sound ow a u ga ma 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 convincing onlookers that the dog was saying, How are you, grandmama? Alec was fascinated with speech and the creation of it, not just in dogs, but in machines as well. It was in the year 1866, when Bell was just 19, that a turn of events would lay the scientific foundation to connect the world through voice. Bell's father encouraged his son's interest in speech and took Alec and his brother to see a unique automation developed by Sir Charles Wheatstone, based on the earlier work of Baron Wolfgang von Kempelen. What they saw was a mechanical man simulating a human talking. Bell was fascinated by the machine, and after he obtained a copy of von Kempelen's book, published in German, and had laboriously translated it, he and his older brother Melville built their own automation head. They were able to make the head say mama, using bellows to control its movement. The talking head was a hit with the neighbors, and Alec knew he was on to something. He had read Hermann von Helmholtz's work, The Sensations of Tone, as a physiological basis for the theory of music. Helmholtz wrote about a tuning fork contraption that could simulate vowel sounds. Bell obsessed over this idea and pored over the book with great intensity. There was a language barrier, though. Bell was reading a poor French translation of a German author and had a difficult time navigating through all the sciencey stuff because of it. Regardless, Bell was able to make a deduction that was critical to the development of the phone. Without knowing much about the subject, it seemed to me that if vowel sounds could be produced by electrical means, so could consonants, so could articulate speech. He also later remarked, I thought that Helmholtz had done it and that my failure was due only to my ignorance of electricity. It was a valuable blunder. If I had been able to read German in those days, I might never have commenced my experiments. After school, he moved to London to live with his grandfather, Alexander Bell. Many of the men in his family were elocutionists. Elocution is the study of formal speaking and pronunciation, grammar, style, and tone, as well as the idea and practice of effective speech in its forms. It stems from the idea that while communication is symbolic, sounds are final and compelling. While living here, Alec further developed his love of learning and language. Later, he would attend the University of Edinburgh, along with his brother Melville, before meeting his requirements to enter the University of London. The trip to London gave Bell the credentials and scholarship he needed. However, 
His time there was met with difficulty and would bring a series of turmoil and tragedies that would change him forever. While living in London, Bell rigorously attended to his studies. He even built a telegraph for him to communicate with his friends. During this time, his brother Edward contracted tuberculosis, which ultimately led to his demise. After his brother's death, Bell moved back home, where he worked as a teacher at a school for the deaf. Bell's advocacy did much for those with hearing difficulties. He even helped a young man overcome a persistent lisp. Tragedy would strike again, when his older brother Melville fell ill from tuberculosis and passed away in 1870. The tragedy of losing two children was overwhelming for the family, and they convinced Alec to move across the ocean to Ontario, Canada with them. The family settled their affairs, sold their estates, and set sail for the new world across the Atlantic Ocean. In April of 1871, Alec moved from Canada to the United States, where he took a teaching position at the Boston School for the Deaf-Mute. He also taught at the Clark School for the Deaf in Northampton, Massachusetts, and at the American School for the Deaf in Hartford, Connecticut. One of Bell's students at the Clark School was Mabel Hubbard. Mabel had become deaf at age five from a near-fatal bout of scarlet fever. Despite a 10-year age difference, the pair fell in love and were married on July 11, 1877. They eventually had four children, two of whom died in infancy. Bell never lost his interest in science and continued to experiment with sound and electricity. The predecessor to the telephone, the telegraph, had problems that needed solving. The big wigs in the telegraph industry were hot to find a new way to transmit multiple messages simultaneously over one wire. Western Union Telegraph Company, the leader in the business, hired Thomas Edison to develop a way to transmit four messages, known as the quadruplex. Why stop at four, they said, so the race was on to send as many messages as possible over one wire. This multi-channel process was known as the harmonic telegraph splitting the signal into multiple channels. Bell's rival, Elisha Gray, was able to develop this method which gave great success in the lab, but failed to make any headway in the real world. The world of commerce needed a practical solution, and it looked like Alexander Graham Bell was just the man for the job. Bell was enlisted to advance a viable harmonic telegraph system. That development would lead to his most famous invention, the telephone. A group of investors led by Gardner Hubbard, Bell's father-in-law, wanted to establish a federally charted telegraph company to compete with Western Union by contracting with the post office to send low-cost telegrams. Hubbard loved the idea of the harmonic telegraph and backed Bell's experiments. Bell, however, was more interested in transmitting the human voice. The science between the harmonic telegraph and the telephone weren't too far apart, and while working on the telegraph, Bell found the time to develop his own technology, an innovation that could transmit a voice electronically over great distances. On February 14, 1876, Bell filed for a patent for the telephone. Three days later, he transmitted the first message over the lines. Working with his assistant, Thomas Watson, Bell summoned him with the words, Watson, come here, I want to see you. Bell would continue to develop and refine his methods making it more suitable for public use. In August of that year, he was on the receiving end of the first one-way long-distance call, transmitted from Brentford, Ontario, to nearby Paris over a telegraph wire. So by the early 1880s, his father-in-law, Gardner Hubbard, helped organize the Bell Telephone Company. The telephone was now a tangible reality and destined for greatness. The success was short-lived, however, and was met with roadblocks that would ultimately threaten Bell's credibility. The victory was immediately met with conflict when Bell's rival, Elisha Gray, filed a caveat for a similar method and a battle was in place for who would own the telephone. A series of court cases in the 1870s and 80s, known as the Telephone Cases, were brought against Bell Telephone and even Bell himself. In 1888, a case contesting Bell's patent was brought before the Supreme Court. Western Union Telegraph Company argued to invalidate Bell's patents. The vote was in and Bell won the case, affirming that his patent was legitimate. 
The American Bell Telephone Company and its successor, AT&T, litigated 587 court challenges to its patent, including five that went to the U.S. Supreme Court and aside from two minor contract lawsuits, never lost a single case that was concluded with a final stage judgment. Eventually, Bell grew tired of the telephone business and sold his interest in the company to pursue other avenues of innovation. In 1880, the French government awarded Bell the Volta Prize, given for achievement in electrical science. Bell used the prize money to set up his Volta Laboratory, an institution devoted to studying deafness and improving the lives of the deaf in Washington, D.C. Bell used the Volta Laboratory to improve the phonograph, coating a cardboard cylinder in wax, calling the device the graphophone. Bell filed for a patent and it was accepted. In 1887, he sold the patent to the American Graphophone Company, which later evolved into the Columbia Phonograph Company. Bell used his proceeds from the sale to endow the Volta Laboratory. Bell even experimented in heavier-than-air flight. In 1907, Bell founded the Aerial Experiment Association, which made significant progress in aircraft design and control. On August 2, 1922, at his private estate, Bell died of complications arriving from diabetes at the age of 75. While tending to him after his long illness, Mabel, his wife, whispered, Don't leave me. Bell lost consciousness and passed on. Upon the conclusion of Bell's funeral, for one minute at 6.25 p.m. Eastern Time, every phone on the continent of North America was silenced in honor of the man who had given us the means for direct communication at a distance. Alexander Graham Bell was buried atop of his estate where he had resided for the last 35 years of his life. He was survived by his wife Mabel, his two daughters, Elsie May and Marion, and nine of his grandchildren. Alexander Graham Bell left his mark on the world of science and invention. The tragedies he experienced throughout his life only inspired him to find new ways to provide comfort and aid to those who need it, particularly those with hearing impairment. He never forgot his upbringing and the time he spent helping the hearing impaired. It only seems fitting that his most famous invention was one connecting the world through sound.